The Old Testament lesson comes from, the, well, it's on page 315 in the Church Bibles, and I will be reading from 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 26, through to chapter 12, verse 13. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the man lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over, because he did such a, such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My reading is from Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, on page 1175 of the Church Bible. Unity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, 
who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he only also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended in the ver is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth we love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. And this reading is from John chapter 6, page 1070 in the Church Bible. Starting verse 24, John 6, verse 24. And once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, what, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Thanks be to God. Uh, we're going to have our talk now. I'm going to invite Charles uh, to, to make, his, make his way up here. and We will pray for you, Charles. I got a bit cross with Charles this morning because, uh, as many of you are aware, I don't normally wear smart trousers. Um, but I realize that I, they are smart. These are my smart ones. Okay, I thought... Charles is speaking this morning. He always looks really, really sharp. He always looks smart. He even looks smart in jeans, but he's wearing jeans. So actually, I could have got away with my jeans, even though Charles is speaking. Charles, let's, let's pray for you. you. Lord God, thank you uh, for this man. Thank you for the word that you have given him. And we pray, Lord, that this morning your Holy Spirit will speak through him to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. One, two, one, two. Yep, I'm on. Thank you. All the short people keep coming up here. Can we 
uh, just uh, take this up a little bit. Just say hi, says Gamaka. Right. We have some tall people as well in the church. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. You know, I uh, have the privilege of um, running uh, a training and a speaking organization outside of the church, which means I am constantly with a lot of uh, dignitaries, uh, prime ministers, presidents. I host conferences and things, and I have to wear a lot of power suits. But I've never felt I needed to dress up that much coming to Christ Church. So I try to dress down. T-shirts and shirts and things. And even that, you'll complain about that as well. Ali. <laughs> so I wonder what happens when I put on my suits. But you are looking at a man who has struggled and has fought for decades with God. I have not come to him willingly, just to make that clear. I have come because I found myself in a place of pain and despondency. I found all my answers. My, I've been to courses. I've spent thousands attending courses all over the world, different parts of the world. I have looked to build a supreme mind. I am one of those people who can solve any problem. You give me a problem, I'll be in my office in the dark with a notepad and a pen, and before morning, I'll solve that problem. I learned communications. I learned how to inspire. I learned how to, all of these wonderful things. But those things were nothing to God. So I struggled a lot with God because I thought, I understood what it took to be a success until I lost everything. My story is very long, so I won't go into that today, because you really need to know where people have come from. And I had to bow, and I mean really bow, where I nearly wore out my carpet, just bowing and crying before God, broken completely, lost all confidence, couldn't communicate, didn't believe in myself anymore. This is somebody who's taught thousands how to achieve how to reach for the stars. I was the one looking for that confidence to live a daily existence. God proved his sovereignty in my life and taught me that I had to bow. And I bowed. So usually when I speak, I speak from a place of power. Because I believe the Christian faith is a faith of power. And you would do well to understand that. So whenever I talk to people, they wonder, why, when are you going to have an off day? How are you doing, Charles? Outstanding. Tip top. How are you doing, Charles? Supremely fantastic. They are wondering why. That is not to say I don't have off days, but I'm never going to tell you my off days. I'm never going to tell you because... I go to God in my closet and I tell him. He has imbued me with power to emancipate, to raise up, to build people. That's my calling. So you cannot find me speaking words of defeat. You're not going to find me doing that. So you're wasting your time, even if you try. But first I want to thank Andrew for the gift in Andrew. He has this ability to take us right to the throne of God. I mean, I was just blown away with the service this morning. In fact, we're ready to go home because it's been so amazing. You know, the power, the power in this place, in this small church. Today, I want to talk to you, or talk to us essentially, about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. You know, if you spend some time looking at the Old Testament, you will find out an idea about who God the Father really is, both his love and his wrath. 
This is why you and I can do absolutely nothing to please God without Jesus. He's not interested in how good you are. He's not interested about how friendly you are. All that is great post-Christ. If you're doing all of that stuff to win him, imp impress him, you are wasting your time. Because he sent Jesus, and unless you bow to the lordship of Jesus, you are wasting your time, just to make it clear. And I want to touch on some areas today, because God is so personal. We have the Holy Spirit on earth right now, who is the only Godhead representative here on earth until the consummation of the age. And his job is to lead each and every one of us personally to the person of Jesus and help us to understand who Jesus is in a special way. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is here. If Jesus is not here on the earth right now, the Holy Spirit is, representing both the Father and Jesus Christ. So Father, as I share your word this morning, let the hearts of your people be open to hear. Let the words that come out of my mouth be directed, Lord, to the hearts of your people. You work in a personal way. Some of the things I will say today will, uh, will essentially be received by people in different ways. You know which of them need to hear whatever it is that I have to deliver this morning. Give me clarity of speech and clarity of expression. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I have noticed when I come to church that I have more fear speaking to you than I have speaking to dignitaries. And I've wondered why for a long time. And I think the reason for that is that there is something about the word of God that needs to be handled with fear and reverence. I can get away with all kinds of things outside of the church. But in church, because we are God's children, he holds us responsible to disseminate his word with accuracy, with fear and with trembling. So forgive me for trembling a little bit before you this morning. Okay? But I know you make me a bit comfortable. So let us uh, begin. The title is The Supremacy of Christ. Now, what does that really mean? <clears throat> My years of consulting in the city of London, I spent a lot of time with very, very senior executives. Some I was able to lead to Christ, to their surprise. But I knew it was the Holy Spirit's doing. He tended to bring to me people who will only receive his word through somebody like myself. And I noticed that because they were in need and they needed confidence. And as a coach, I had to provide that for them. But when you ask people about God, every, nearly everyone will tell, oh, yes, oh, God, I love God. If you want to really test people which God it is, ask them about Jesus. And immediately, you will see some glazed look over their eyes, some denials some running around trying to show we are really into God. They will not really want to endorse Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the key. Which God are they serving? Which God are they talking to you about? Unless they mention the name Jesus, you are dealing with a totally different spirit. And for those who are serving other gods and serving Satan, they will never, with their mouth, acknowledge or endorse Jesus. Test it and see. That's how you begin to know the key. The key is Jesus. If you are leaving Jesus out, you're wasting your time. And I'll prove that to you today. So what does Christ mean Christ, what does it mean? This amazing savior of the world, what does it mean? To the surprise of many, Christ is not Jesus' last name or second name. 
Christ actually comes from the Greek word Christos, meaning the anointed one or the chosen one. This is the Greek equivalent of Meshach or Messiah. Jesus is the Lord's human name given to Mary by the angel Gabriel. We all remember that story. Christ is his title. Just like you have prime ministers, you have presidents, Christ is Jesus' title. Signifying Jesus was sent from God and by God to be a king and a deliverer. Jesus Christ means Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the Anointed One. In ancient Israel, when someone was giving a position of authority, oil was usually used in the anointing of that individual, signifying that this person has been set aside or set apart for God's use or for God's purpose. Just like you had the kings and priests and prophets were anointed in such fashion. There are hundreds of prophetic passages in the Old Testament that refer to a coming Messiah who will deliver his people. Ancient Israel thought their Messiah will come with military might to rescue them from terrible kings and from terrible oppressors. And they were disappointed when Jesus Christ came because they came for much more than that. They thought he would deliver them from decades of captivity from pagan nations. But the New Testament reveals a much better deliverance provided by Jesus the Messiah. And this is a deliverance from the penalty of sin. Christ came to deliver us from the penalty of sin. The Bible says Jesus was anointed with oil on two separate occasions by two different women. But the most significant anointing came by way of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' title of Christ means he is God's anointed one, the one who fulfills the Old Testament prophecies, the chosen Savior who came to rescue sinners, and the King of kings who is coming back again to set up his kingdom on the earth. This is the one whom we serve. Jesus, the Son of God, is the logos of God, or the expression of God. The only begotten of the Father, and he himself is God. Father, as God incarnate, he reveals the Father to us. The Son of God is both the agent of creation and mankind's only redeemer. Everything you see was created for Jesus Christ. Everything you see. He is the agent of creation. And mankind's only redeemer. Only redeemer. I need to emphasize that. Because what is going on in the church today, we have been moved and drawn into this false belief and understanding that there is one God for everybody. It's not true. The secular world would try to get, especially my kids, kids going to school, private school, public school, uh, state school, whatever, they will be challenged to change their positioning. And the greatest jobs we have today is wrestling with our children on the God path and say, no, son, no, that's not it. Because they will change their mind. Oh, we all serve the same God. It's just a different name. It is not true. Allah is not Jehovah. Let's get that clear. Now, these things are not politically correct at the moment, but we are not interested in being politically correct when it comes to God. We're interested in bowing to the Lordship of Jesus. And what I'm saying to you right now, he is the only redeemer 
for mankind. How is he going to do it? That's his job. That's not your job to worry about. But how am I going to? That's his job. He has a plan. He uses us to fulfill that plan. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 1. And let's just refer to this verse real quick. Because this is very, very important. If you look at Hebrews chapter 1, starting from verse 1, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Through whom he made the the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So Christ is sitting right now at the right hand side of the Father in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And then it goes on to make that point. Christ is the exact representation, expression, image of the God whom none of us has ever seen. So in the New Testament era, anything you are going to get, let me emphasize that point, because I had to learn that myself. Anything you are going to get from God is in Christ. Let me emphasize that right now. So you don't waste your time. You know us human beings, in fact, I'm going to touch on that a little bit, how we love works and religiosity to get to God just so you don't waste your time. To understand God's mind. I watch all the time and I see a lot of people who are trying to win. I do this better than this person. I am more religious than... I just laugh. They don't understand what God is about, what Christ came to do. They don't understand yet. And you can't blame them because man usually wants to work their way through things. Ephesians 1.3 tells us that we have been blessed, past tense, not present, not future tense. We have been blessed with all, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All. God is not going to do another new thing. He's done all he's ever going to do. Listen, let's kind of understand scripture. He's done all he's ever going to do. You just need to locate it, appropriate it by faith. He's already given. You know, the beginning of this year, January, I teach goal setting because I teach leadership and coach on leadership and all these wonderful things. But I found myself completely worn out this new year, 2015. I was really reluctant to do my usual annual planning. I said to God, Father, I'm tired. I am tired. And I really went to God. Lord, I'm exhausted. I said to God. But you know, the Holy Spirit is so amazing because he brings to your remembrance some of the things you have studied and learned, but you did not remember. And he kept on telling me about rest, 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 finding God's rest. And you know what? I can't use the word challenge. Maybe I can use a softer word. I petition God. I say, Lord, I want your rest because I am tired. I told you. This is August. Do you know my income has grown by 50% this year? I have done nothing to increase that income. I'm telling you the truth. I have done probably the one that I probably, usually I do my marketing, my networking, my campaigns, you know, the stuff. We, 
this year since January, I am telling you as the Lord lives, I am seeing numbers that I've not seen before. And I've done nothing about it. Yesterday, he told, the Lord reminded me again, rest. He has, just like the big, he has carried me. I mean, if you see me right now, you wouldn't even know I have a business. I hang out with my kids. I'm sleeping. I'm waking up 10 o'clock in the morning. I do a little bit of work on the phone on my computer. I do some international calls. I receive. My September is booked. Solid. From Shell to big, big business have booked my September. And this is August. I mean, September is booked solid. And the kind of work we do, some of you know that what we invoice is not small stuff. Okay? And his books are. I am just trying to tell you it's not about your power or your might. It's about allowing the spirit to take control. And it takes a while for that penny to drop. But I went to God sincerely and I told him, Father, I am tired. It was probably the second month, third or fourth week that I put down some goals and just presented them to God and I realized. Let God do what he says he's going to do. If we will trust him. The challenge is we don't trust him. We want to do it for him. And he will leave you till you get to the end of your rope. You're about to strangle yourself. And you scream, help, father. And he shows up. Are you ready now to allow me to take control? Okay, if you're not, stay right where you are. He's a disciplinarian. He would discipline you because he has to develop his Christ in you. So what did Jesus mean when he said, I am the bread of life? As we heard in the passage that just, just, was read a few moments ago. I am the bread of life is one of the seven I am statements that Jesus made. He also used that same phrase, I am. In seven declarations about himself. In all seven, he combines I am with tremendous metaphors which express his saving relationship toward the world. And all appear in the book of John. Each of the I am statements represents a particular relationship of Jesus to the spiritual needs of men and women. Jesus said that he is the light in the darkness. He is the light in your darkness. He will bring you light. He is the gate to your security. And he is the shepherd that will guide you. He said in Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eyes upon you. Don't be like the mule that requires beat and bridle to turn it around because it lacks understanding. The imagery I have is Jesus behind you, his right hand on your shoulder, pointing the way you should go. This way, daughter. This way, son. I will guide you. I will guide you. Follow me. He declared that he is the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. I discovered that truth is a person. Because ignorance may attack that truth. Malice will deride that truth. But at the end, truth is truth. It is still standing. These include, I am the bread of life, which came down from heaven. And this is not to satisfy our physical hunger, but to satisfy our spiritual hunger and our spiritual thirst. So that we don't focus only on bread, physical bread, but we focus on eternal bread that never runs out. 
He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall never walk in darkness. So you want to know the truth, ask for the light of the Lord to magnify that darkness and to chase it away and to magnify the truth to you and you'll find the truth. Those of us in business, sometimes we are not sure which decisions to make or which direction to go. It is so comforting to hand it over to Christ and declare his word and trust that he will guide and lead you towards the truth. And you have safety and you have peace. He said, I am the door of the sheep. All who came to me before, they were thieves and they were robbers. He's saying to you, I am the final authority. Lean and depend on me and it is taken care of. You don't have to look to no other. I am. None. No one else is going to come. I am the deal. I'm the final authority. Rest in me. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by my own. Why? The job of the shepherd in antiquity, when you study it, is that the sheep needed direction, they needed help, they needed protection. And the shepherd usually will protect this sheep with all that they have got. Jesus is using that same word or the same metaphor of a shepherd trying to say to you, I will guide and protect you with my life. Or I have guarded and protected you with my life. I'm keeping a watchful eye over you. I will not allow you to be destroyed. I will not allow you to find yourself in dangerous situations. If you allow me to watch over you by acknowledging me, that's all you have to do. I am the son of God. Either as the Pharisees thought that he was a lunatic, telling them he was the son of God when they saw his biological parents and knew how he was born, and then he said, I'm the son of God. They thought, this guy's lost it. And that was one of the biggest challenges they had with him. But he said, I am the son of God. He is the one sanctified by the Father and sent into the world to save all of mankind. Then he mentioned, I am the resurrection and the life. Many of us have dead situations in our lives. Things that are not working. Things that have stopped working. Things we desire so much have no idea how to reignite, resuscitate. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I give life to dead situations. What situations in your life have you given up on that you think is dead? that you truly desire. Call on the one who is the resurrection and the life and watch what he's going to do with that situation. He said, he who believes in me, though he may die, but yet he shall live. Why? Because Jesus is the source of both. There is no resurrection apart from Christ. There is no eternal life equally apart from Christ. He is both life and death. He represents both. I am the true vine. Even though we cannot physically see Jesus, he wanted us to know that we are closely connected to him as the branches of a vine are connected to the stem. We will keep on receiving the nourishment. We need to live an exemplary and productive existence as long as we are connected to that vine, to that stem. No matter where you are, 
The Bible teaches us that the kingdom of God is within you. So God is closer to you and I than breath. You just need to whisper, Father, wow, and here he is in action. Jesus, oh wow, here he is in action. I remember a story coming from, uh, my son was two, uh, three, we're coming from France. And it was snowing in England and we just left Calais, we got to Dover and we began to drive. I had this sports car then, a two-door job. And um, before I knew it, the car just went into a ski. You know, Mercedes are not very good in snow. Really, really terrible in snow. And all of a sudden, my wife, my, new, my baby son, everyone in the car, the car began to swerve. And I just screamed, Jesus! I just found the car instantly. It was by the ditch. I remember it this day. Because you can never forget when God shows up for you. You can never forget. And we're right there, and they came, they told us, and they told us all the way home. Dover. Safe. No bone, no none hurt. They could have fallen way into the ditch. Smashed or hit by different cars driving, but the Lord rescued us. And you can never forget. Right after feeding of the 5,000, Jesus made the first of the recorded I am statements in John 6 through 5. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Bread is considered a staple food in any culture. A person can survive a long time on only bread and water. Bread is such a basic food item that it becomes synonymous for food in general. All of these plays into the scene being described in John chapter 6 when Jesus used the term bread of life. He was trying to get away from the crowds to no avail. If you remember the story. He had crossed the Sea of Galilee and the crowd followed him. Jesus takes this moment to teach them a lesson. He accuses the crowd of ignoring his miraculous signs and only following him for the free meal that they are going to get. And then he began to teach them, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. When they ask Jesus for this bread, Jesus startles them by saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is a phenomenal statement. First, by equating himself with bread, Jesus is saying to you and I, I am essential to and for your life. Two, the life Jesus is referring to is not physical life, but eternal life. Jesus is trying to get the Jews, you and I, thinking of the physical realm and into the spiritual realm. He is contrasting what he brings as their Messiah with the bread he miraculously created the day before. That was physical bread that perishes. He is spiritual bread that brings eternal life. Third and very important. Jesus is making another claim to deity. This statement is the first of the I am statements in John's gospel. The phrase I am is the covenant name of God, Yahweh, revealed to Moses at the burning bush. The phrase speaks of self-sufficient existence or what theologians have called aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y which is an attribute only God possesses. It is also a phrase the Jews who were listening would have automatically understood as a claim to deity. Fourth, notice the words, come and believe. This is an invitation for those listening to place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God. This invitation to come is found throughout John's gospel. Coming to Jesus involves making a choice 
to forsake the world and follow him. Believing in Jesus means placing our faith in him that he is who he says he is. And there is the key. And that has been our struggle. Believing that Jesus is who he says he is. And mankind has always struggled with that. We want to find a, a different way. Last time I spoke here, I mentioned to you how I fasted one time for seven days, thinking I was very spiritual. I fasted and fasted, asking God, break through, Lord, break through all of these wonderful words. At the end of my seven days, nothing. And I was silent thinking, Lord, you mean all this work, you've not heard any of my prayer? And one little word at the close of prayer, the seventh day, believe my word. That's all he told me. Out of that seven day of fasting, believe my word. Isn't that amazing? Believe his word. So, let's wrap this up. If there's anything the history of human religion has taught us, it is that people seek to earn their way to heaven. This is such a basic human desire because God created us with eternity in our mind. The Bible says God has placed the desire for eternity in our hearts. The Bible also tells us that there is nothing we can do to earn our way to heaven because we have all sinned. And the only thing our sin earns us is death. There is no one who is righteous in himself. No one, not just one. As I conclude, our dilemma as human beings is we have a desire we cannot fulfill. No matter what we do, that is where Jesus comes in. He and he alone can fulfill that desire in our hearts for righteousness through the divine transaction. And what is that divine transaction? For our sake, he who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf. And our sin was imputed on him. And his righteousness was imputed on us. We did not deserve that. When we place our faith in him, our sins are imputed to Jesus and his righteousness is imputed to us. Jesus satisfies our hunger and thirst for righteousness. He is our bread of life. I'm not sure about you. Many of you are wonderful and good people. But I find myself sometimes in a single day going to God and saying, I'm sorry, again. You know, about two weeks ago, I said, Father, I'm 50 years old. And I feel like a baby every time I'm coming to you. Sorry, sir. Sorry, Lord. Sorry, sir. Sometimes I'm like a military general. Sometimes the amount of times in a week I have to go to God and say I'm sorry, I feel embarrassed. One day it crossed my mind, can you imagine if God held our sins against us? Now all you grown, wonderful people, think about it for a moment. I'm not sure about you, but I know about me. The amount of times in a day, sometimes, the Holy Spirit brings to my mind. Oh, God, come on. Sometimes I struggle. All right, sir. All right, I'm sorry. Lord. I'm sorry. The amount of times you have to say, does it happen to you too? No, maybe not to you guys. Only me. I have to say, I'm sorry. Either in your thought, in your deed, in the wrong words you use, speaking to somebody. How many times you have to go and say, I am sorry. Not forgive me, you're already forgiven. But I am sorry, sir. I re I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lord. God just wants you and I to try harder. Harder. As he begins to build us towards that image of Jesus Christ. He knows we're going to fall and fall. He keeps picking us up. This is why God told Peter. When Peter was so boastful. Oh, Lord, I've done so well. I've forgiven this guy seven times. The Lord, what did he say to him? 70 times 7, which means repeatedly forgive. Repeatedly let go. Repeatedly forgive and hope 
that you are becoming better. And finally, John 10.10. 10. Because of my despondency, I discovered John 10.10. 10. I have always believed God created me to reign on the high plains of earth. Because why should I, a prince of heaven, be struggling when those who don't know God are riding on the higher plains of earth? It didn't make any sense. And I asked God about this. John 10.10 10 is the key. He says the devil has come to kill, to steal from you, and to destroy you. The devil has come to steal from you, to kill what belongs to you, and to destroy you. There's nothing good about those three of words. That's what the devil came to do. But Jesus rose up and said, I have come to give you life, but life in abundance. Life in what? What the devil has stolen from you. He said, I've come to replace it. What is yours that the devil has killed? He said, I've come to give it life. What the devil had that's destroyed, he says, I've come to restore. Everything he's come to restore it, give new life to it, replace what has been stolen. Call on Jesus to replace everything that belongs to you, everything of yours that has been killed, everything of yours that has been destroyed, call on him and watch him do it for you. That's what he's come to do. God bless you. Thank you.